Nigeria. And I would like to say a special welcome to you and everyone, um, most especially our panelists who has greatest time out of their busy schedule to join us and to share from their experience and also our faculty members who are on also on this call. I want to appreciate as well our dear executive students and um, every one member of the Rome Business School community, you're welcome to today's edition of the Industry Spotlight. And most important about today's edition is the fact that we'll be discussing kickstarting Africa's next big business. And every one of us who came into Rome Business School either for career acceleration or to aid our entrepreneurship part. Um, but key among it is the fact that our nation at this point needs, we need most, much more than ever before, we need startups and businesses that will grow and take over across every sector of the economy. <clears throat> Projected is just a highlight of um, an overview of the difference between high income countries and low income countries in terms of number of firms. Um, you could see that most high income countries have large number of micro and medium scale enterprise. And you look at that of low income and, uh, countries and you realize that the middle is missing. And that's exactly what we are experiencing currently across Africa and also especially in Nigeria. A situation whereby you have high number of micro um, enterprises that are just set up for the survival of the business owner or the trader. And then you have, on the other hand, large corporations as well, multinationals coming into the country and coming into the market, and um, is a huge market. But the missing middle is where most of us um, are supposed to fill in, where we begin to create businesses that engage people, businesses that create employment, businesses that are sustainable and are structured in such a way that they can accommodate growth. And so today, across um, all the topics that we'll be speaking, our panelists will be going deep on each assigned topic to share from their experience what they've done so far. And everyone speaker today is someone that has built um, and is still building a growing enterprise. And they started from, relatively, they started from the scratch and they also, they are playing in the market where we are. They are playing in Nigeria and they are playing in Africa. And so without um, further ado, I would like to welcome our first panelist for today's um, session. And our first panel panelist is someone that we are familiar with in the Rome Business School community. And that's Mr. Onyeka Akuma. Mr. Onyeka Akuma is a serial entrepreneur and the chairman of Farm Crowdy, Nigeria's first digital agricultural platform with a network of over 420,000 farmers in January 2021. Connecting them with finance, market access, and technical expertise across all states in Nigeria. Onyeka was recently named one of Africa's Person of the Year, winning the Agricultural Champion of the Year 2020 across the continent for the work and impact Farm Crowdy has had on hundreds of thousands of farmers. Onyeka was appointed to the e agric Stakeholders Forum by the Federal Ministry of Agriculture in Nigeria and was also made one of the youngest members of the Honorary Council of the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He has been featured as one of the top 50 disruptors of 2020 by the Africa Report and listed as one of the 2020 top 50 innovators to watch across the globe. 
by the globe shakers. As a software engineer turned digital agri entrepreneur, Onyeka continues to lead a new generation of millennials excited about the potential of agriculture, its romance with technology, and the benefits for the continent of Africa. He is also the CEO of Plenty Waka, a bus hailing company in Nigeria that is thriving and creating and making life easy for working class professionals and Nigerians who are traveling in that state. So at this point, I would like us to welcome Mr. Onyeka. Mr. Onyeka, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Um, thanks for having me. Hi, Sam. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, Mr. Onyeka. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Can you see me? Um, yes. OK, great. Um, thanks for having me. Now, I'm quite excited. I know we have a very limited time for the call. So I, I'm going to do my best to just talk through the topic um, that you've assigned to me. Um, thank you, Sam, for having me on this call. And um, every time I have the opportunity to share at Rome Business School, I do my best to make myself available and I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks for, for having me. Um, thank you, sir. It's always an honor to have you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I, I, do I have ability to share my slides now? Sure, you can. You can. Okay, so I pretty much will be talking through a topic um, centered around driving growth in an emerging market, right? And um, I'm going to be, let me see just quickly so I can share my slides. Okay. Um, so I just did a, a little presentation on it. So it guides the conversation. I hope you can still see my slide. Yes, we can. Okay. Now, one of the things that excites me about driving growth, I mean, in any economy, especially in the emerging markets, is the opportunity that we presented with consistently in those markets to see how we create for ourselves what we call, um, we, we have some form of capitalist mentality in, all, in how we um, take advantage of opportunities within those markets. Now, um, a bit about my background. I, I mean, you've mentioned, you've given my profile out, but I think just a slight change to um, the profile you read out is that I now focus on Plenty Waka, um, the daily operations of Plenty Waka. I'm no longer um, CEO of Farm Crowdy. And while doing what I've done in Farm Crowdy, which is some of the lessons I pick up, I mean, it's exciting to see one of the uh, panelists also, someone I really respect in the agri space. Um, who will be speaking from the agriculture angle um, um, in the, the Dr. Ndidi. Um, I, I really um, have huge admiration for the work she's done um, with Leap Africa and all the organizations she's involved in. Now, uh, I think one of the things that have excited me about agriculture has been the impact you can have on millions of farmers. I know in the last four years, we've worked with 450,000 farmers in farm crowding. Um, and the scale of our operations continues to grow. But then there's also what we've done recently in areas like transportation. And that's also exciting me. And that's where I'm, I focus now my attention on. Now, just coming back into the main cross of the topic, one of the things that I, I, I found really interesting is the fact that um, 3 billion consumers in emerging markets will be online by 2020. Now that's massive. Um, even and this, these numbers were predicted as a, just at the end of just while we're getting into the COVID um, era. But what makes it even more exciting is how much impact we see now in these numbers um, with what has happened with COVID, which I'll speak to. But by next year, this number is now being predicted to be smashed by an additional 20%. That's an additional 600 uh, uh, million people. That's, you're looking at 3.6 billion people that will consume items online globally across emerging markets by next year. Now, what is even more exciting is how many of them are actually doing stuff online and as it concerns markets like Nigeria. Um, you have um, 
it's estimated that four trillion will be consumed globally. But what is more exciting is what happens in Nigeria, where you would have Nigeria playing a leading role in this market. Now, just this graph that I presented here is for us to have a view on um, markets like e-commerce businesses. So just looking at um, which is going to be one of my focus, e-commerce and transportation. And then just looking at what Jumia did um, in terms of their numbers in Nigeria versus Africa. Uh, if you see those numbers, it just tells you what the potential in Nigeria can look like. You have 97 million people, um, roughly about 97 million. This, this is actual count. Um, it's estimated as over 100 million now um, that are internet users. Um, these are people that are using mobile devices. Um, these are people that are purchasing online. As at the time we started Jumia um, in 2012, um, I was part of the founding team there. It was very difficult to get people to buy items online. People struggled with that. People struggled with trusting the platform. People struggled with looking at platforms like Jumia and saying, will they really deliver on the items that they say they will deliver on? Now, what we've seen is those numbers have grown. Um, last year alone, 108 million. So as at this time, we had about 97.2. This was in 2000 and 19, according to a Boston group, the Nigeria was taking a key role. But last year, um, some figures have come up just in the last one week. About 108 million people um, use the internet and about 98% of them use the internet and find one way or the other to buy some things online. Now, what is really affecting these emerging markets is there's a developed digital market demand. A major factor to that was COVID. Now, just going back into it, the developed digital demand came from a place where people weren't able to move from, um, because of the restrictions that were placed by COVID, people weren't able to move from their houses to the shops they were used to buying from. People weren't able to move from, um, people weren't able to order for food items and then maybe even go to those stores and get the food items or sit in restaurants and get those food items delivered to them. I'm sure every one of us at this call, at one point in time, have seen where we had to order for something online. Even if you've not used the internet to order for anything online in the past, that happened in many, in fact, not just in the margin markets, across the world last year, COVID pushed consumer behavior to go online, to start demanding for items online. Um, a program like this we're having right now in Room Business School, when we first started, I mean, when, when people were teaching online, people weren't coming to the internet and having many digital sessions. Everybody wanted to be there in person, to have an impact, to feel, to touch and feel the, 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 the person speaking. But COVID pushed people to now start doing the, I mean, right now it's a normal thing to say, I'm having a virtual call and I'm speaking to thousands and thousands of people across the world because of what that incident or what the pandemic had done. Uh, domestic economy performance, um, Bradley is seeing a lot of demand and it's affecting the mark, um, emerging markets. There's a lot that has been put in pressure on the currency. Generally, the dollar goes up. Um, there's a lot of demand that has been put on commodity uh, performance. Um, people are in trading as much as possible. And then technology is dominating a lot of what we're consuming um, across emerging markets generally. And then you see people that are involved in technology, building what they do in technology. So platforms like Zoom are beginning to thrive and are beginning to sell well. Platforms like Jumia in Nigeria, platforms like Conga in Nigeria, and platforms like Netflix. Netflix had to find a way to start selling more movies online because the cinemas were no longer open. And so you just had a sporadic growth of demand for digital um, assets and digital consumption across the globe, not just in the emerging markets, but more predominantly in the emerging markets. And all this has been as a result of what happened last year. Now, what we see, uh, people talk about the new normal, and people talk about um, um, what will become, no, I mean, if we'll ever go back to normality um, in years to come. But I'm telling you, I mean, from even my experience working with people, there's a new normal that will be the normal, and it will no longer be new. One of the things we see is remote work. 
<coughs> people are no longer as excited, especially with millennials, are no longer as excited as about going into traffic and then driving from one place to the other in order to get to a job and work from a particular office or the other. People are moving, uh, consumer behavior is changing from, I have to walk into a store to buy an item. Now when people are used to ordering on phones, people are used to ordering on platforms like likes of Jumia and Kunga and Gigi. <clears throat> and this is now reflecting in e-commerce businesses like this, where their revenues, as much as you have a slight decline from, I'm um, not, but some major decline, uh, uh, roughly about, um, roughly about 21 million euros um, decline from what happened in 2019 to 2020. Um, businesses like Jumia are beginning to see major boom. I mean, 2021, um, a company like Didi in the transportation space was able to declare profit. Um, in 2021, you see the likes of Jeff Bezos and Amazon be reached the height of becoming one of the wealthiest people in the, um, in the world as a result of the kind of transactions that happen on their platform. You have the likes of Stripe able to do some very interesting deals. You have a lot of payment gateways in the country able to do some very interesting deals. Jumia was able to declare its... Um, as uh, its numbers and i mean even with a very tough year we're still able to get about 140 million in 140 million euros in revenue it applied to other sectors as well like transportation now as much as there are over 600 000, 600 million people that move on a daily basis with things like buses a place where i play in with plenty worker what we've seen is that uh, the transportation sector continues to generate a huge amount of traction and people are beginning to use, I mean, for instance, we've seen a lot of growth in um, Plenty Waka's um, usage of its service, but people don't want to order for bus services. Now people are paying attention to security, people are paying attention to safety, safety not just from a sense of banditry, but also safety from a health perspective. Everyone wants to now copy and see what safety measures are being put in place by the different bus operators so that they can make an informed decision on who they will buy from or who they will consume from. Um, Nigeria with its large population, people are now paying attention. Customers are a lot more aware of the health hazards involved in traveling and want to make better decisions and come to platforms like Plenty Worker to compare pricing between a, 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 a transport operator that is taking you from Lagos to Abuja as we, a transport operator A versus a transport operator B, and not just looking at it from a price perspective, but looking at health um, um, and concerns, looking at safety concerns, and making informed decisions. We're seeing a lot more traction um, with businesses um, that are using technology to drive um, their growth. Now, what is going to eventually um, help this kind of growth sustain itself over a long period? One is innovation with technology. So as I mentioned um, what we've done with um, Plenty Worker, and I've mentioned what has happened in e-commerce space, it's applying itself to several other sectors. I didn't want to speak on agriculture um, because I wanted to let um, um, the other panel speak about that. Um, but you have seen things around uh, um, um, different sectors, whether it's agriculture, um, whether it's um, um, transportation, whether it's health, whether it's finance. One of the ones that I really love is what has happened also in the education sector, where people are now able to go into schools uh, without getting into schools, without getting into a wall of a school. So you have the likes of you lesson that is allowing, people, allowing students to now access their curriculum online. And that kind of innovation technology is democratizing education for the common man to be able to access um, using mobile devices, using, using their laptops from any part of the world, as long as they have internet access and access to the software. So innovation with technology in emerging markets will consistently drive the growth of businesses in those markets. And Africa is not left alone. Nigeria is not left alone. And it's something we're really excited about. Then investment in distribution. <clears throat> Even when um, the lockdown was in place, businesses like um, food items, because as much as there was a pandemic, people still needed to eat. And we were able to get approvals to move food items from state to state. Now, that level of uh, 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 flexibility for a business and sustainability for a business to still thrive in the face of the pandemic shows you how much value it has. People still lived in shelters. People still needed medical supplies. People still needed medical, medical, um, 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 
um, supplies. People still needed uh, medical services. People still needed some form of education as soon as there was calm um, in, in markets. And so the investment in distribution is going to consistently drive the growth. So we want to see more logistics um, investment. We want to see more logistics, I mean, sorry, investment in infrastructure that allows for the distribution of services. That is investment also in internet services. This will continue to drive a growth in emerging markets as it cuts across countries across Africa and also countries like Nigeria. And then the last thing is local entrepreneurship. Now, many of the markets that really drive, and the reason why many people didn't want to close their borders and was because they didn't really have so much that they could produce themselves, apart from being just, apart from markets where they felt they could handle um, situations like what happened last year better. Those that closed early, um, local entrepreneurs thrived because they were able to produce for themselves and, and sustain the economy. But beyond the pandemic situation, um, what we are now seeing as a major driver for growth is where economies are focused on how local entrepreneurs are producing what they will eat um, for themselves to eat, what they will consume for themselves to consume, all done locally, and that eventually has an effect on um, 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 it has an effect on, on on currency exchange. It has an effect on trade. It boosts the economy of the individuals in those markets to become. Better um, economies to emerge into major markets and make them sustainable over um, a long period. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. I got a message. So we see this as a major contributor um, to how we drive growth in emerging markets. And for me, and, um, um, and what I have seen from my perspective, um, as you look at the different areas that people will need services, whether it's food, shelter, health, education, finance, entertainment, transportation. In these major things, security, communication, with investments in technology in them, investments in the distribution of these services, and the encouragement of local entrepreneurship to drive these different sectors we will start seeing for ourselves entrepreneurs that are building and driving growth in emerging markets like Nigeria. So, I, I mean, this for me was just to give an idea, on, I mean, to kick start the conversation on how um, you as entrepreneurs come into the sector, look at the advantage of what you can do, pick the different angles um, you can invest in, and eventually kickstart that conversation for us on how we drive um, um, emerging groups in our economy. So I'm, I'm very excited. I just, I know I had uh, pretty much about 30 minutes to talk through this. I just wanted to go through and then hit um, the nail on the head and I get this conversation going. I look forward to the conversations that happen after this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Onyeka. Thank you for the insight talking about, you spoke to innovation with technology, investment in distribution and local entrepreneurship. I think it's much of um, the drivers that you highlighted and um, everyone on this call, I know we are already deploying technology to our business growth. And um, there's a lot that Mr. Onyeka has shared. At this point, um, we'll just open up the session for questions um, to Mr. Onyeka. Um, it was quite fast because of the time we have, like you said. So, and we are also looking at um, a situation whereby you will also have opportunity to ask the panelists questions as they make their presentation. Please, if you have any question um, at this point, we'd like you to engage uh, Mr. Onyeka directly. We'll put you on the spotlight. So if you don't mind, you can on your camera and use the raise of hand button, um, ask your question now, please. So do we have anyone with a question regarding driving growth in emerging markets? Um, Mr. Onyeka has just given us an insight on um, starting the next big businesses. And if we are going to kickstart the next big business, 
It begins with understanding how to drive goods because Nigeria and Africa is an emerging market. It's predicted that we have over uh, close to a billion people in terms of cons consumers. And so this is a huge market potential. And there's rarely any multinational that does not have um, a, a vice president or VP for Africa. There's rarely any multinational. That's to tell you that um, Africa is a big market and a huge market. So um, it, it's also important for us as nationals to begin to tap into the vastness of the market and deploy technology just like Plenty Waka and Farm Crowley has been able to use technology to create innovation in sectors where we least expected that there could be something that will be done. So if you have a question now, we'll take your question. If, if there's none, we'll move forward. So any question, um, you, you might not have an, another opportunity to ask questions regarding the presentation made by Ms. Uh, Mr. Nyeka. Hello, Mr. Dikan. Hello. Okay. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. We, we can hear you. Kupola is on the line. Okay. Yeah, but, um, I, I want to appreciate the presentation of Mr. Oyekan, uh, particularly concerning the innovation with technology, investment in distribution, and local entrepreneurship. Uh, I, my question is in the absence or in the presence of insecurity, can these three works? I mean, when there is insecurity, in terms of insecurity in the country or in any environment, can this, this three work with that, you know, adequate security? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Mr. Onyeka is asking if in the face of, I don't know whether you got his question. Yeah, I got it. I got a question. Oh. Um, so in the place of insecurity in the country, um, he's asking whether these three things can still work. Yes. Uh, now, just to address that, um, one of the things I, I recently, I'm, I'm going to use an example and then to answer the question and then um, just help you understand how I see things. Um, recently, we signed up um, a boss partner in Plenty Worker called GUO, and we're able to onboard 600 buses um, um, 600 buses on their inventory on our platform so that customers can start booking for um, state to state travel. So if you're going from Lagos to Abuja, or going Lagos to Kotakot or, or Lagos to Rivers or where, anywhere across about 17 states. And somebody came online and said, he asked me this question and he said, you, you guys, are, I mean, congratulations to you guys. You guys have onboarded 600 buses from um, GU on your platform. But I think you people are missing the point. I was like, okay, please explain the point to me. And it says, okay, why focus on providing security? Why are you there onboarding buses? And this was my response to him. Every person have their own, everyone has his own quarter to contribute. I am designed to create solutions in one sector. I'm not designed to create solutions in all sectors. I pick my strength, I assess the risk in the areas that I operate, and I deploy my, my capital, I deploy my resources to try to create value for my customers in my area. It is true that, and so my answer to him was, as much as I can contribute as much as I can advise, as, as much as I can, can give um, an approach perspective to what can be done to improve security, it's not my own job to provide security. Is that I start deploying um, whatever measures I need to deploy to have the roads safer. I wish I had that solution, was built to, build, um, built to create a solution for that. I will do it. But I know a couple of friends that have devoted themselves that that is going to be their own business to do. And they're currently doing that. And what I can do 
is partnered with them. I am bringing people to get convenience, to get buses. They partner with me to get the roads safer for people. That's their own work. I do my own work. Now, that's how I see at uh, dealing with situations. You break it down to see what's your strength, focus on yours, let everybody do theirs. Now, coming down, if I take that, I'm speaking from a business owner. Now, if I take that to one side and I speak from a perspective where I am very aware that you have security concerns uh, across the country, what I would advise an individual to do, if you're building a business, do your risk assessment. Um, analyze where it's safe for you to do business for now. And then as the places, because as much as we talk about security concerns, I mean, we're still fortunate that it's not the entire market. It's not the entire scope of the market. That is unsafe. There are still places that are safer than others, where if you're building a business, maybe you want to do your risk assessment and say, I wouldn't go to this frontier. I wouldn't go to that frontier. Let me stay in this place that is safe for now. Once, once I'm doing, I'm trying out my MVP, I'm building a business out of it. If the markets become safer for me to move to the next place, I do that. But it shouldn't be an excuse for you not to try and do something with what you want to do in the business you want to do. Now, going specific into investments in distribution, innovation in technology, and the last one being um, um, in innovation in technology, investment in distribution, and local entrepreneurship. The combination of all three, I want to create value for customers within where I've done my risk assessment and I feel safe to drive it. And then gradually, as places become safer, I do my bit there. And then replicate the model in other markets. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Onyeka. Thank you for this feedback and wonderful answer to the question. Um, I would like to ask, we'll take one more question and then from the audience and then we'll move forward. Any other question? Um, okay, um, Hector is my name. And um, I am concerned about um, how Africa can compete with the Committee of Nations because um, um, what we're discussing today, uh, Imagine African Market, uh, if you uh, take the e-commerce, for instance, um, look at Alibaba, Jumia, and uh, Konga, the key players in that area, you will discover that um, um, Africans do buy from some of these platforms, um, international platforms. What do you think, Mr. Wilson, that Africans can do to ensure that our content are exported through that platform of e-commerce to the rest of the world? I uh, thought that this could make our economy uh, more buoyant and then uh, bring more money to, uh, to, to our, uh, our revenue here in Africa. I'm, I'm concerned about that. So if you can help, uh, I would be glad. Yeah, just speaking to that, I think one of the things I've seen that's a major hindrance to um, export-driven businesses succeeding is standardization. Um, standardization from a perspective where, say for instance, you're a tailor and you make shirts. Now, what's, so first, before standardization, I think it's training. Training to a level, um, okay, Sorry, I think something changed. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So first is training. Training to a level where you understand the standards that are required um, across um, international standards that are required in creating, I'm gonna use my shirt for example. In creating this shirt, what standards are required? What training do you need to make a shirt like this that meets the standard that is required in Nigeria and is required in South Africa and is required in Toronto in Canada and it's required in New York in the US. And everything is the same. Where if you say it's a size 17 shirt, it meets all the standards of a size 17 shirt. 
And if somebody picks it up in the US and he picks it up in London and he picks it up because you said it's a size 17 shirt, it meets that standard and I get a size 17 shirt. One of the biggest hindrances to export of our services is training, training that allows us to meet number two challenge, standardization. And then number three challenge is marketing. Because one of the things I've seen is, I mean, I was speaking to one of my co-founders. I was studying a particular business yesterday that is doing something similar to what paint workers did. And I told him how that business in the space of one year expanded their business. This is a business that started with capital of about equivalent of about 2 million Naira. They started up today. This business I'm talking about is a $4 billion business. They started with equivalent of about 2 million Naira loan. And within a space of one year, they, ex they grew the business and exported the business into other markets to try other, when I say other markets, other countries, to try at the house to see how, how would people respond to this business. But before they did that, they got the training right, they got the standardization right, and they had a global perspective of exporting their business. And so they started doing marketing. Now, we always restrict ourselves very, I mean, a lot in, on this continent, in Nigeria, pretty much on the continent, on hey, focus on Nigeria, focus on the Nigerian market, um, on the Nigerian market. I am a fan for that. But very quickly, as soon as you have standardization, as soon as you have an MVP that works, what stops you from replicating that model in other markets? What stops you from trying it in other markets? It's one of the biggest restrictions we put on ourselves here, where we don't want to do businesses that want to export. After you've met all of this, so first you do all these things, you know that you're a world-class service, you know you're a world-class um, world organization, you know you have world-class products that will match any other person out there. Then export, then market, then talk about it across the globe so that people hear about it and they want to invest in it, they want to be part of it, and they want to replicate it in other markets. So these three things, I mean, just taking it from the question you asked, these three things are the big hindrances. And if a company, a product, or a service is able to deal with all of them, then you start having more businesses go out. A lot of people speak about um, export restrictions and all. I speak first about these three things. If you deal with these three things, you'll find your business is moving beyond the shores of the continent. I hope that helps. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Onyeka. So we'll just take the last question for you. Um, what has been your greatest challenge in building your business in such um, a volatile environment like Nigeria? No. So, okay, let me start first this way. I like to say positive things about Nigeria. The more you say negative things about the country, it affects how you think, it affects how you create solutions. It just affects if you will even have a vision or even have a dream of doing something here. So as much as, yes, there, there's a lot of chaos, I would say, what I will rephrase the question to what is my challenge of building a business in Nigeria? Whether it's volatile, whether it's a troublesome country, what is my challenge of building a business in Nigeria? And uh, I'll speak to that without just taking out that adjective that was included um, to the country. And let's ha have some positive things we say about the country. So these have been one, um, we're in a market where, so first I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, in, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur that's focused on technology-based businesses, right? And um, I started working with startups in 2010 with the likes of Okanao, then joined Jumia as an um, founding team member, and then did stuff with Kunga. Now, prior to me joining Wakanao, there was one phase of entrepreneurs that had done stuff with technology and the internet before the Wakanaos, Kungas, and Jumias. I call them the first level entrepreneurs. Then you had the Kungas, Wakanaos, and Jumias, they were second level. Then you have the new sets of them, Paystack, Flutterwave, they are the third level. All these guys were products of the second level, and the products of second level were maybe products of the first level. It's an ecosystem that is growing. 
And so if we're looking for talent five years ago, you find it a lot more difficult getting talent than if you're looking for talent today. And you find it easier if you're getting talent in the next five years than if you're looking for talent today. So the ecosystem is growing. My challenge five years ago um, was how do I get people to understand the use of technology in a sector that wasn't so much tied with technology, which is agriculture. And so it was difficult to explain to people finding the right talent to work with. So talent was my first challenge, but that is getting a lot more easier. That's getting a lot more better. Who was funding? Um, how do I get the right kind of funding? And I had to go through what I'll call a school of funding because I found out that as much as a person says he's an investor, he may be an investor that's investing in every sector, or you would rather focus on an investor that's investing in your sector and an investor that's investing in your market and an investor that has the money today to invest. Because he may be an investor that's investing in your sector, investing in your market, and is excited about your business, but maybe he has reached um, the end of that funding uh, yet and maybe he's just prospecting for his future fund so all that research that goes into attracting the right kinds of investors the things that i had to deal with i had to pitch to so many people to then learn not so many people it's not as much as pitch to that makes you get the deal it's pitching to the right investor after you've done your research so funding was a I think we lost Mr. Onyeka. Okay. Um, so, Onyeka, we lost him? Yeah. We had a bit of internet challenge. Um, so, funding was a problem then. Um, just to, to recap on the question I was dealing with, funding was a problem then, and um, one had to deal with that bit from researching. Um, and then the next um, major challenge was um, understanding the product you are selling and how to identify customers that fit in. Um, going through that MVP stage of starting small but thinking big, um, going to that MVP stage of trying out with first of customers and getting feedback and then improving on the process. Those are challenges one had to face. Uh, Amongst other personal challenges, I mean, you will go through a lot of disappointments. You go through a lot of um, heartbreaks to say no to you. Um, you've got to always be pitching and finding ways to sell your business. I mean, you go through all of that like every other entrepreneur will. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the end goal that continues to motivate you and having the right kind of team members, co-founders to join you on that journey, to reach your goals. Those are things that continue to keep you going. So those are challenges I had to deal with. I've been starting my businesses. Um, but over time, I think from moving from one business to the other, we've gotten a lot more better. Enjoy the process. A business may fail, pick the lessons from it and do better in the next business. Do not get so personal with your business ideas. Um, they, they succeed, be humble, they fail, learn your lessons. Because many of the times you can have the best idea, you're on the wrong time to execute that idea and it fails. I mean, just be humble and take on those lessons. And then if you succeed, still be humble and never think that it's all by the strength you're doing it. And just take all the lessons you get from it and then build a um, sustainable business, build something that will be exciting, build something you'll be proud of. So those were challenges that I had to deal with in my business. And, um, and today we continue to grow. I hope that helps answer that question. Yes, yes, I does. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, we deeply appreciate your session and taking our time to answer um, these questions. And um, it's, it's really been an insightful 
session with you, driving how you grow in you know, the margin markets, and you've been able to share your experiences with us. And we deeply appreciate Mr. Onyeka. It's always a pleasure to have you um, at Rome Business School. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. So um, we'll be inviting um, the next speaker, which is Thank someone. You. Thank you. Um, I, um, my greetings to Dr. Ndidi. It's nice to see your face again, Ma. Hi, Eka. We're so proud of you. Keep up the good Thanks. work. Great to connect. All right. Bye bye then. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right. So our, our next speaker is not that, but Mrs. Ndidi Okonkwo Muleni. You're welcome, Ma. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So nice to have you, Ma. So nice to have you um, for creating our time for our students to join us on this call. We really appreciate. And uh, we know that we'll be getting to learn more from you on this call. Um, so uh, we'll be inviting to the stage, Mrs. Ndidi Wuneli. We're supposed to have Mr. Stephen confessed, but um, he's still trapped somewhere. So uh, at this point, I will have to introduce us to Mrs. Ndidi. Mrs. Ndidi Wuneli is the managing partner of Stra Consulting Agrican Nutrition Limited, which works across West Africa shaping agricultural policy, creating catalyst ventures and implementing ecosystem solution. She is also the co-founder of AACE Foods, which sourced from over 10,000 farmers and produce a range of packaged spice seasonings and cereals for local and international markets. And it is also the founder of Leap Africa, which inspires, empowers, and equips a new which inspires and equips indicator of principled discipline and dynamic young leaders in Africa. She is also the chair of Nourishing Africa, a digital knowledge financing and data hub, which is enabling agribusiness entrepreneurs in 34 African countries to scale. She started her career as a management consultant with McKinsey and Company, working in Chicago, New York, and South Africa. She holds a, an MBA from Harvard Business School and an undergraduate degree with honors from the Watson School of the University of Pennsylvania. She is also recognized as a young global leader and shrub social innovator by the World Economic Forum and received a national honor from the Nigerian government. Ndidi serves on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Nigerian Brigwood PLC, Heather King, and a lot of other companies. She's also a serial author. She's the author of Social Innovation in Africa, a practical guide for scaling impact. And her recent book, which um, our master in agribusiness students are using for their book review, um, Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Scaling Resilient Agricultural Business. She is a third global speaker and her work has been featured on CNN, BBC, and a range of international and local media outlets. It's always an honor to have Mrs. Ndidi. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our speaker, Mrs. Ndidi Muleni. Mrs. Ndidi, Thank you're welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I commend all of you for enrolling in this program and for advancing your careers as professionals, as an entrepreneurs. Um, what is the format? Do you want me to give a presentation or do you have set questions? Sorry. Just to clarify. Yes, we just give you, you wanted to give a presentation, ma'am. Okay, so I'll just give a quick presentation um, on my work and my journey and uh, try to go through this in about 15 minutes so that we'll have time for questions. I hope you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so I got into this food and agriculture sector because of this picture on the right. When people think of Africa, they think of hungry children. And this picture made me angry because agriculture is the 
real um, silver bullets in our continent, everything can grow on this continent. There's no reason why we should be net importers of food or why one third of our children should be stunted. And over the last 25 years, I've worked in different spheres, but over the last 12 years, worked exclusively on the food and agriculture sector through Sahel Consulting, through Ace Foods, and some of you might know Ace Foods, uh, which is about almost 12 years old now. We source locally and process spices and complementary food for local and international markets. And I found out that I was struggling to grow many of these companies and so were many of the entrepreneurs. So I spent the last two years working on a book. And as uh, the presenter mentioned, this book has been given to the Rome Business School students to really understand what are the opportunities in this sector, who is scaling and how can we make money and do good in the sector. And I'll share some insights from my research and from my own work. First, there are a lot of critical realities and challenges in this sector. I'm sure that your previous speakers have talked about the challenges associated with climate change, high rates of post-harvest losses, infrastructure, talent and financing gaps in the food and agriculture landscape, the poor regulatory environment, the gender inequity, and the regional and global trade dynamics. But yet there are a lot of promising trends. Uh, Monyeka must have talked about the digital revolution going on in the food and agriculture sector, which allows us to leapfrog the number of young people getting excited about the sector and embracing technological advancements and innovations, the growing middle class that's more sensitive and appreciates nutritious food, a growing interest in healthy diets because of the rising rates of cancer and diabetes and other non-communicable -commun diseases, and the focus on equity. So this book starts off by really saying, what are the opportunities in the sector? And I am here to tell you, there are a lot of opportunities in the sector. Many of us have left this sector for foreigners and multinationals to take advantage of. Um, and when we think about this sector, we always think about smallholder farmers who are subsistence on one end of the spectrum, our large companies on the other end of the spectrum, not realizing that SMEs are the lifeblood of the sector. 80% of the food we eat in this country in Nigeria and in, in the continent is produced by SMEs who are input providers, logistics providers, aggregators, processors, chefs, cooks, retailers, across the board from farm to fork. We are really an opportunity, there's tremendous opportunity for SMEs, but what limits them? And what has limited the growth in this sector? The most important thing from my presentation that you should take away is this issue of your business model. And as an entrepreneur, as a professional, you need to think about what the business model is for any business that you're starting, whether it's in agriculture or food or in any space at all. And through my research, I identified six key components of business models that scale. The first is that your business model has to be demand driven with measurable value addition. Many times we come up with ideas that we think everybody wants because we want it, but is it really demand driven for millions of people? And with Ace Foods, the first idea we had was to create jams. And many of you know jams, right? We put them on bread or in scones, but the truth is the average Nigerian does not eat jam. I eat jam, I love jam. We came up with recipes, including abalumo jam, which doesn't require pectin. Mixed fruit jam, all sorts of jam. But we realized very quickly that only a small percentage of Nigerians would eat jam every morning with their bread. And that it was a niche product and it wasn't scalable. There were a lot of other challenges with our business model when we started Ace Foods. Another challenge was that packaging was not readily available. If you want jam to last for one year, it has to be in glass, not plastic. Meanwhile, the only two major manufacturers of glass jars in Nigeria, and they already have orders from the large breweries and Coca-Colas of the world. Second is that your business model has to leverage data, technology, and innovation. There's no way you can scale if you're not leveraging the data generated. And if you're not leapfrogging, Third, you have to shape policy. You can't wait for policy to shape your business model. You have to get out there and be involved in industry associations, trade associations, shaping the environment in which you work. Otherwise, you wake up one day and your business is obsolete. Fourth is that you have to invest in cost-efficient dynamic systems and structures. Fifth, your messaging has to be compelling. You have to tell your story with clear branding, even the name of your business, how you sell yourself, how you package yourself. Many of us say, oh, why is it only a few people who everybody keeps on talking about? It's because they know how to package themselves. And finally, you have to embed scaling into your DNA. 
realizing that COVID-19 was one shock, climate change is a bigger shock, but there are gonna be many other shocks. So how can you build in resilience into your DNA to be able to survive in spite of the recent shocks? Now, there are so many opportunities in our space um, and so many opportunities for leveraging technology. And two companies I profile in my book, Cowtribe, which uses cell phones to get uh, information to farmers that have livestock. And then it connects these farmers to vet doctors in communities across Ghana. Twiga is another company based in Kenya that connects farmers to roadside sellers, ensuring that they can get access to fresh fruits within 14 hours after their orders have been placed. And across Africa, we see so many businesses leveraging tech for financial inclusion, advisory services, market linkages, digital supply chain management, macroagricultural intelligence, leveraging improved seeds that are drought resistance and flood resistance or crop protection products or providing extension support for farmers. And through my work with Sahel, we're doing this, we're seeing this live. We are running the Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria project in five states in Nigeria, ensuring that Nigerians have access to fresh milk. Nigeria has the fourth largest cattle herd in Africa and yet we're net importers of milk. And so the project is really focused on helping local dairy processors that make yogurt and milk source from farmers. So we're leveraging innovation and technology to ensure that we can settle our farmers, we can teach them how to uh, milk hygienically, we can improve the productivity of their cows, and we can link them up uh, to markets so that through financial inclusion, they're also getting paid for those milk they sell. In addition, we're leveraging a lot of innovation and technology provided by research institutions like IITA, through the basics project, ensuring that we have improved seeds for our cassava industry and that our large cassava processors can also work with these research institutions to generate um, varieties that work for them. Um, and that's one of the things we're doing through the basics project. So beyond your business model, staffing is another huge challenge and it's not unique to the agriculture sector. Everybody who works in, Africa complains about finding good talent, retaining good talent. But what is unique about our sector is that most people don't want to work in agriculture. The image of this sector is still a poor man's business. Um, so we have gone to schools to try and change mindsets of young people, to get them excited about the opportunities in the sector. But to be able to do that as a leader, you have to build your capacity to attract and retain talent. You have to constitute a strong board of directors you have to ensure that you involve your staff, you give them ownership and you structure yourself for excellence and innovation. And there are many organizations I profile in my book, including So Fresh, including our work at Sahel Consulting, um, but also companies such as Good Nature Agro in Zambia and New Cafe that are leveraging volunteers that are building private extension worker training sessions and schools to ensure that they have talents to build their businesses. Amplifying your voice is so critical. From your company name to your logo, to your brand colors, your tagline, your brand promise, your online presence, how you leverage digital marketing in agriculture and food is critical. And I profiled many examples in the book, but one of them is Hello Tractor. And I'm sure some of you have heard of Hello Tractor. He has branded himself really well as the Uber of tractors. And he started in Nigeria, but now sells software to tractor manufacturers to enable them to be able to reach out to not only tractor owners, but also smallholder farmers who need the services. Um, and he's gotten all his big uh, customers, John Deere's of the world and Caterpillar to be the ones advertising for him. Um, Java Foods is another example in Zambia. Um, after living in Nigeria, she saw how well Indomie was doing. She said, I can replicate this in Zambia and her company is, is called Java Foods, but her noodles are called Easy um, Noodles. And uh, she's been able to really pull out a niche in Zambia by targeting young people. She also has a super cereal, um, which is also um, highly nutritious. Now, financing is something that comes up over and over again. And through my work from my book on social innovation Africa to this book, there's quite a bit of financing in the food and agriculture landscape. And if you go on nourishingafrica.com and search by Nigeria, you'll see so many opportunities, 15 pages of funding available to you. But what we realize is that most companies are not investment ready. They don't have strong financial systems and controls. They don't have a board. They don't have um, strong governance structures. They can't show a strong business model and potential exits for investors. 
And yet there are prizes and grants and cross subsidization, venture capital, crowdfunding, challenge funds, all available to you, but you have to be able to demonstrate that you're serious about your business and that you're willing to be transparent and accountable. And if you can do that, funding will be begging you, funders will be begging you um, to, to take their money. Um, in the ecosystem, there are quite a few organizations, Blue Moon in Ethiopia, a MasterCard Foundation funds all over Africa. Um, we have Ashoka in Nigeria, co-creation hub. And every single day people write me, they want to start new hubs and new accelerators in the Nigerian context. So if you're serious about this sector, there's a lot of support available to you. Please go on nourishingafrica.com, join the nourishingafrica.com platform, and also put in your email so that every week you get opportunities, a list of funding, um, challenge grants, and or everything that you can leverage. You have to shape your ecosystem. And I talked about this. There's nobody who can succeed in the food and agriculture sector without shaping the ecosystem. Our sector is very similar to education and health because it's so fragmented. You have to partner with others. You have to find out who the enablers and the beneficiaries are in your sector. Um, you have to shape policy. You have to understand the policy regime in your sector. Um, and it's really critical that you take advantage of all those opportunities that exist. And then you have to map out your sector. In our food sector, it's NAVDAC, SON, but who are the competitors? Who are the influencers? What are the cultural norms of the society? Um, who are the professional associations? And cultural norms are very important, but they can be changed. Growing up, I, I don't remember anybody eating something like Indomie. My grandmother saw spaghetti. She'll say it's like a worm. She doesn't want it. And now you see everybody eating instant noodles. They spent a lot of time and money changing mindsets to get Nigerians to buy their noodles. So there's so much more we can do with healthier food in our ecosystem. And there are many examples across the board of companies that have shaped policy, have shaped the ecosystem. And one I visited in Rwanda is called Africa Improved Foods. And I was really inspired by them because they set up with the government as a partner, but with funders, uh, international and local funders, and a very strong pipeline with farmers as well. And finally, you have to build your business resilience. You know, research indicates that 43% of businesses never reopen after a disaster, and 25% of companies that do fail within a year. And COVID-19 really shook us, all of us. Um, I'm sure you also felt the impact, but there are gonna be many more shocks. And the question is, how do you build your resilience through your savings buffer, how you invest in insurance, how you manage costs, managing debt and cash obligations? investing in regular scenario planning and seeking opportunities for support. So as I round up, I feel a real sense of urgency, especially in the Nigerian context. We all know that we're facing a food, food scarcity in Nigeria at the moment, and it's only gonna get worse. Food prices have doubled in some cases. Uh, egg prices, I was complaining that eggs went from 800 naira crates to 1.5. Um, Gary prices across the country. And with the insecurity in our nation at the moment, we can only imagine what will happen. Before COVID, 57% of Nigerian households could not afford a healthy diet. Now people are seeing the rates are closer to 80%. So we need to ensure the availability and accessibility of nutritious food. Anything that is important that we can grow locally is a business opportunity for all of you. Because with the continued devaluation of our currency, we have to look inwards and start processing more food for our people. We also have to ensure that it's affordable. 30% of household income in, in India is spent on food. Pre-COVID, 57% of household income in Nigeria was spent on food. This is unacceptable. Um, so we have to, we have to think through what it will take to produce nutritious food for our people. So through Nourishing Africa, we set our business in COVID. It's a digital company. Um, it provides services for entrepreneurs across Africa. Um, and there are lots of membership benefits. Ask an expert. We have our first Thursdays, which is a networking opportunity. And we also launched an entrepreneur recovery program with the support of the United States Development um, Foundation and MasterCard Foundation. We trained 2000 entrepreneurs and we're giving funding to about 200. So it's really important that you take advantage of this. And I'll end with my vision. You know, I started in this sector many, many years ago before it became the flavor of the month. And I have a very clear vision that by 2050, we collectively have to envisage a sustainable, flourishing and job food ecosystem, which leverages ag tech and digital innovations driven by Africa's vibrant entrepreneurs to ensure that the continent nourishes itself and becomes a net exporter of food. But we have to build stronger partnerships. We have to build our capacity. 
We have to ensure that we have talent for the sector. We have to invest in catalytic and patient capital, and we have to join forces with each other. And that's why when the Rome Business School invited me, I was excited because I really believe there's no one who can solve the problems in our sector alone. We have to work together. And my current mantra for all the organizations I've started is based on this quote, the Tibetan quote that says, if I tell you my dream, you might forget it. If I act on my dream, perhaps you'll remember it. But if I involve you, it becomes your dream too. I want to involve all of you in this dream. I started with a picture of hungry children, but this is the picture that I want you to remember when you think about the food and agriculture landscape. Young Nigerians who grew up to live full and meaningful lives because they have access to healthy food produced by entrepreneurs who are driving catalytic change, doing well and doing good. I look forward to partnering with all of you to achieve this in our lifetime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ndidi. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I mean, it's mind blowing to see how much you've done in the agri sector. Um, by the way, I use your spices. It was just coming across your profile a um, few months ago that I realized that you're the co-founder of the company that's AACE. Um, I've been using the spices and I believe that everyone on this call um, does the same. Um, we have, interestingly, we have a lot of agribusiness players in on this call and some people might want to connect or join the sector at the different value chain, storage, um, invest finance, you know, production, processing, packaging. Someone asked, and the question is, um, an upcoming agripreneur based in the FCT of Nigeria. One of my greatest challenges is sourcing packaging materials such as bottles and resealable packs. How can I overcome this challenge? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so my first advice to everyone on this call, if you're interested in this sector, is please, please, please go on nourishingafrica.com. We created this because I used to get questions. Ndidi, I want to enter cassava. Where can I get cassava seedlings? Ndidi, I want to enter poultry. Where can I get? And I said, listen, just go to one place. We have data, we have links, we have support. It's free. Everything you need to know is there. And then if you join as a member, you can ask other members for help. Um, and so please go on nourishingafrica.com. Um, there's lots of challenge around packaging in Nigeria, but guess what? There are quite a few companies that have great packaging. In fact, our sister company, Sahel Capital, has invested in a, a packaging company in Ibado, and they do very innovative packaging. So please visit Sahel Capital. Um, you'll see the companies that they've invested in and you'll see the packaging company. I think it's called Polyfilm. But there are quite a few packaging companies. It depends on what you package. Um, and sometimes you might not find it in Abuja, but you can find it in Ibadan, you can find it in Lagos, um, across Nigeria. So even Kanu has some very innovative packaging companies. Um, I'm not sure I know any in Abuja, but if you join uh, nourishingafrica.com, they can also help you. All right, thank you so much, Ma. We'll take um, two additional questions from the participants. Danish, your hands is raised. Can you unmute your mic and ask your question now? Oh, well, I'm sorry, it was actually raised in error, but she has answered the question on sourcing for, you know, information on uh, Italy and capital. She has answered that, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Any other question from the participants on for Mrs. Ndidi? Okay, Peter, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Oh. Okay. Do you have any other question for Mrs. Ndidi? Okay, someone asks. What is being done about preservation of food items in Nigeria? 
So one of the reasons we started Ace Foods was primarily because of this high rates of post-harvest losses. 40 to 60% of our fruits and vegetables go to waste. 20 to 30% of our tubers and grains go to waste. And so we start a company that will process for the local market, displace imports and also export. And so we're leading in this area around spices um, and, and flowers, but there's so many opportunities. I mean, I'll use an example. It's, it's the season now we can eat corn. How many of you have been enjoying roasted corn and boiled corn? In a few weeks, there'll be no corn, right? And that's unacceptable. In other parts of the world, you have frozen corn, you have canned corn, right? You have all sorts of, it, we, my grandmother used to even dry corn um, and hang it in her house. Now, many of us don't do that. Uh, we, the maize prices are, are cheap after harvest and are so expensive. Um, a few months out. So there's so many opportunities. The same with mangoes. I love mangoes. I'm sure many of you do too. You go to other parts of the world, everybody dries mangoes. There's canned mangoes, there's you know frozen mangoes. Why can't we experiment with other types purees? That's why I wanted to do jams because I was like, this is the easiest thing, puree fruits so that you have them available all year round. Um, but what I would even suggest before you introduce a product that Nigerians are not used to is to say, what are we currently importing that we could produce locally? And anything that we're currently importing that we can produce locally is a win because it doesn't take a lot to convince people to switch. All right. Thank you so much, Ma. Uh, and I, Peter, I see you... somebody mentioned Nigeria Export Promotion Council. And I think, yes, we have to export, but I would say, First, let's displace imports. Nigeria imports too much food, and that's why the cost of food is so high. So right now, there are opportunities for, to provide food for the Nigerian consumer. It's good to export so you can get access to Forex, but right now, there's a desperate need for food for locals because we spend too much money on food. All right, thank you so much, ma'am. We take another question from Peter. Peter, you can ask your question. All right, thank you very much, Sam. And also thank you very much, Business in Didi. And uh, I must say that uh, I'm really impressed to see that we have uh, a personality like you in this kind of uh, space, and uh, you are really <laughs> making things happen. You know, but, but, but looking, at, looking at the food scarcity, looking at, you know, in coming years, I've seen that people are forecasting that uh, there, will be, there will be food scarcity. And then looking at the, um, constrain with the logistics of food, you know, from one state to the other. You know, what opportunities are you seeing? What can you forecast? What's what? What are you look? What are you looking ahead? You know, for for young entrepreneurs who want to go into this space, what are you forecasting? What are you looking at? Will be a a a a good business model for them to you know to drive. Let's take for example tomatoes. Let's take take for example onions. You know, most of these things come from a particular part of the country to other part of the country. And sometimes they are being constrained due to the movement, due to logistics. And um, uh, at the time where they try to come in, they're very expensive. So what do you advise young entrepreneurs who are in different locations to take advantage of? You know, what opportunities are you foreseeing? That's just my question. Thank you, Peter. So this is the first chapter of my book. And the first thing I, I tell young entrepreneurs is what are you passionate about? Don't just tell me you're passionate about making money, right? It's not enough. It won't sustain you in any industry. You, what are you passionate about? So in your case, are you really passionate about onions and tomatoes? I'm using that. I know you used it as an example, right? Because if you're passionate about onions and tomatoes, you're going to have to get really knowledgeable about onions and tomatoes. There are many types of onions, right? And one key opportunity is onion powder. I'll just throw that out there, onion powder. So what is the issue with onions? About 80% of onions is water. The same with tomato, right? And guess what? We transport water from Kanu to Lagos. Instead of processing it in Kanu and transporting it, it's going to be much cheaper. Thus will spoil if you're actually processing it in Bornu or Kanu or wherever. And there's the same with our meat. We transport our cows instead of transporting the meat. So what do we need? Cold storage drying equipment, solar-based equipment that farmers can process at their farm gate. 
And there's a lot of opportunity in onion powder because nobody wants to be spending. I think the onion prices, I, I, the last time I bought onions in Lagos, one onion was 100 Naira. Usually you get four onions for 200, right? So first we have to process and there's equipment for processing, there's logistics for processing. So there's money in the equipment, there's money in the logistics. The second is you have, to, so I don't know if it's what you're passionate about, but if it's onions, let's use that. The opportunities from farm to fork for onions, right? tremendous opportunities. And I can tell you Nigerians import onion, flour, onion powder. Not only the fast food companies, the hotels, the chefs, they import onion powder. We cannot produce enough onion powder in Nigeria. People don't want to be the ones grating the onions, drying the onions, for it to lose 60% of its, its value, 80% because it's water. So first figure out what you're passionate about, then figure out what aspects of the value chain you want to play in, whether it's inputs for onions, seeds for onions, for production for onions, processing. So Ace Foods does not grow anything. We just buy from farmers. We train the farmers on what we want and we process. You can't do everything. You can't plant, sell the seeds, sell the fertilizer, all the way to producing, processing, distributing. So you pick where in the value chain you want to play. Is it providing ICT? Is it providing financing? Is it logistics? Is it packaging? And then when you figure that out, then you say, am I going to be a B2C, business to business? Or am I going to be a business to consumer? Ace Foods started primarily as a business to business. We're selling to noodle companies. We're selling to fa uh, fast food companies in sacks, unbranded, right? Until we decided we have to start retail. You can't do everything. So some companies are pure business to business. Others are business to the consumer. Others are business to government. So figure out what your entry points will be and who your customer is going to be. And then develop your pricing strategy and all other strategies, product packaging, distribution strategy. It's not easy to start any business, but the same process you'll take to start an agricultural business is the same process you'll take to start any other business. But you have to be passionate about it because you don't make money overnight. This is a sector where money takes time. <laughs> you have to be patient unless you're selling um, weed, unless you're doing, um, what is it called now? There's a botanical name because in some parts of the world it's very profitable. I hear some people are starting to grow in Nigeria. <clears throat> I don't advocate it, but uh, unless you're growing some medicinal herbs for, for those markets, this sector takes time um, and you have to be patient five to seven years to really make money. But once you start making money, it's very sustainable. All right, thank you very much. Ned. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ndidi. Um, Kate, the, the link to um, for you to get the book has been shared on the comment section. But if you still have another question, you can just throw in and then we'll wrap it up with Mrs. Ndidi. You can unmute your mic, your hand is up. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Ma, Ma, I must say, indeed, I'm true. Like, I've been, I've been working with FX for years now, and uh, your knowledge of agri is just out of the world. Ma, please, uh, is there any mentorship um, program you have for young agriculturists because it will help. Yes, thank you for asking that question. We actually have a, a program called the Sahel Scholars Program, and I'm going to put in a link um, for our upcoming events. Uh, it's okay. coming up on July 7th. It's a free event uh, for oh, young people you. interested in the sector. And I encourage you to please sign up, um, Sahel Scholars. I'm just looking for the link for the registration. Okay. Um, and it's, it's um, going to really talk about how you can make money in the sector, who, uh, who are the players in the sector, et cetera. Um, so please check it out. Let me just find it as we speak. Um, okay. And so if you, for those who are still in university, we actually do have um, funding uh, for, for you, um, and we have internships. Uh, but I will let you please sign up to the Sahel Scholars Program and our upcoming conference, and please share it with your friends. We're trying to okay. get young people excited. And one of the people that um, is speaking actually is, um, there are lots of people speaking at this conference who have done really well. And uh, one of our keynote speakers is actually a young man who started Kobo 360. And he's providing logistics. I'm sure you know, you've heard of him. 
And he's raised close to $50 million in Nigeria uh, for his business. And they basically use, they basically are providing logistics trucks to transport food um, and fertilizer and seeds. Um, and they've raised so much money because it's so tough to manage logistics and most people want to outsource it. So please register for the Sahel uh, Scholars Program, share it with your friends. Uh, I think the first 200 people or so who join the conference will get their airtime paid for. Um, so please register. Okay, ma. thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ma, it's been for a your pleasure joining you all, and I wish you all the very best. God bless you. Thank you so much, Ma, for joining us. We it's really been an interesting session with you, and we look forward to more time with you like this. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much. Congratulations to you again. And again, I'm posting the link to the book because some people said they still can't find it, and we can get digital copies on nourishingafrica.com as well. All right, take care, everyone. Okay. All, All right, right, thank bye you. Bye. You can also pick your copy at Rome Business School if you're a student. You can just pick your copy with us. Thank you, everyone. So um, thank you. And we'll be taking our last panelist. And that's Mr. Femi Adejumo. Mr. Femi Adejumo is the founder and CEO of RAG Bill Gates Affiliated Venture Backed Distributed utility that provides energy reliability to residential, commercial, and industrial customers in Nigeria. Femi has led the company to complete a 9 million US dollars equity capital injection from four tier one global investors. The company enables SMEs and economic clusters run sustainably by providing reliable and affordable uninterrupted electricity with rooftop solar solutions. Beforehand, FEMI executed nationwide rollout of four mobile telecommunication access networks. He mm. was the single point of contact on rollout and managed service operations projects to multinational telecommunication OEMs, including Everything, Hawaii, mm -hmm. and Nokia across Africa, South America, and Asia from startup phase to nationwide phase. With 15 years experience, FEMI is particularly skilled at operation excellence, deploying high availability and reliability for operations ranging from solar energy to telecommunication. His work has been featured on several local and international press, including CNN, BBC, CNBC, Yahoo Finance, Channels TV, and a lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, join me as we welcome Mr. Femi, Mr. Femi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. you can unmute you. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you so much, sir. So at this point, you have the floor. Okay, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, I have a, a very short presentation. I knew that uh, the panelists before me would have done a lot of justice to, to some of the topics. So I just decided to, to take a different approach, but of course I believe that uh, the question and answer will, uh, will unearth maybe a few things that I might not cover here. So my name is Femi Adeyemo and I'm the founder and CEO of Energy. Energy means alternative renewable energy. So we clip the name from, uh, from that three words, alternative renewable energy. And basically what we do is to be uh, part of the solution to the hydra-headed energy crisis that we have in Nigeria. And uh, similar to what uh, the previous speakers uh, mentioned, 
I mean, we also believe that, uh, I mean, we have to be the solution to, to our problems in, uh, in Africa and uh, especially in Nigeria. So as a company, our mission is to provide sustainable solutions to energy reliability crisis in emerging markets. But of course, they say charity begin at home. So we're starting uh, from home. Um, so I want to focus really on what are the criteria or, or what we call the drivers of business growth. Uh, I mean, knowing fully well that a lot of what is required to start business, I mean, from your business model and all of the MVPs that need to happen. I mean, I knew that Onyeka and Dr. Ndidi would have done justice to that. So um, while, uh, I mean, just taking time to, to, to research how best should, I mean, should I approach the, the 15 minute conversation? Uh, I thought I should uh, take uh, the participant through I mean, just give an highlight of uh, these drivers of business growth. And this is a work put together by EY. I mean, of course, I believe that everyone on the call uh, know EY. And uh, so they are put together what is regarded as seven drivers of growth from people to technology to operations, customer, uh, finance, transactions, and risk. I mean, in an organization, uh, we see drivers of growth not entirely different from what had been put forward by EY, but we had it, uh, I mean, more or less like two different components. And uh, I will mention that when it comes to operations, we regard this as operational excellence because we believe that that drive the point home uh, uh, better for, for us. And of course, uh, Grit is a word that everyone in my organization is very familiar with. And towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to share with you, uh, I mean, our culture uh, or value pyramid, where we have seven sets of values that, uh, that drives the organization. Of course, the speakers have talked about finance, and I'm going to spend some time to just uh, maybe say a few things, uh, I mean, particular to how we went about uh, raising uh, the Series A equity uh, that we raised in the organization. Of course, uh, partnership and transactions, especially for companies that are just starting. Uh, I mean, you might not have the opportunity to, to be part of big transactions or acquisition, but partnerships from the get-go uh, opportunity to partner is always up there. And uh, of course, risk, especially when we bring it down to the context of Africa or back home in Nigeria, risk. I mean, still entrepreneurs that <laughs> at face every, every, other, every other day or every other hour or every other minute. So we can't uh, do justice to this topic without discussing risk. So I will, I will go into each of those uh, uh, eight topics, uh, and I'll start with people. So to be able to scale organization, especially in the context of building uh, a scaling business or, or, or driving business growth in Africa, you need people. Of course, uh, as entrepreneurs for as many that are entrepreneurs on the call. And I want to believe that, I mean, it's not everyone that will be entrepreneurs on the call, but you could be, you could be the lieutenant, you could be the second in command. And even at that, so in our organization today, even though yes, it's Femi Adeyemo that is more or less the pilot, but what I have been intentional about doing is to ensure that we have a people in the bus. People that if I am not available today as the founder and CEO of the organization would still run. As entrepreneurs, as you are trying to build your business or even people that have businesses already, one of the things that it's very common uh, in this part of the world is a one man show. And if you want to build a business that will scale, that will not be good enough, especially if you are looking at bringing in institutional investors, right? There is what is regarded as key man risk. So if you want to build a business, 
that will last several generations after you. Uh, you need to build it around people. It can't be around you. So you have to build your team uh, with solid people that could help you and work with you to be able to scale the organization. Second, technology. Uh, of course, COVID-19 had, had shut in uh, whatever plans into the future that several organizations have uh, when it comes to technology, because it became very clear to everyone across the world last year that for businesses to scale, to grow, you have to leverage technology. I mean, food vendors that were not thinking of maybe delivery uh, had, to, had to pivot last year or had to leverage technology to ensure that they, they continue to, to be in business. Uh, so, and technology, I will try to give some, some examples of what we do in our organization energy. So uh, we actually sit uh, in between, I mean, hardware and software, because for several organizations, it could just be only software. And we've seen several businesses across the world that are scaled, uh, just leveraging the software arm of technology. But for us, given that we know that for us to be able to make solar affordable to Nigerians' homes and businesses, we need to demystify that myth that, oh, solar is expensive. So we had to leverage technology that building hardware that we were able to put in between the solar architecture that then allow system to shut down if customers are not making payments. That technology also enable us to de-risk the investments to, to, uh, to investors because we build a technology that allow us to say, you know, Nigerians, Africans, you don't have to pay us to own solar. You can either do it on a lease to own basis where you will own the system maybe over six years, over five years, 60 months, or you can even decide not to own it at all. We can deploy the system in your facility, in your business that you just pay us on a monthly basis. Similar, so instead of you burning money on on buying diesel or petrol on a daily or weekly basis, spend that money towards uh, a cleaner alternative. So it's this technology that we were able to leverage. And that's why we want to build a business that will grow, not only in Nigeria, but across Africa. Technology, uh, the, the, the need or the impact of technology cannot be overemphasized. The next is operational excellence. Operational excellence cut across, I mean, the previous speakers spoke around scaling, spoke around marketing, around even your internal process. You need to, I mean, your customers, when your customers call you, you have to be there for them. They need, the customers need to know what numbers to call. If you have, I mean, customer experience has to be top notch. So those are some of, I mean, what is required for you to to be operationally ready and to excel operationally. Because if you want to grow, I and mean, we're talking about 54 countries in Africa. So if you want to grow across Africa, you need to ensure that your operational excellence is top notch. How are your processes? Do you have those internal processes? Uh, uh, sorry. Um, okay, so those are questions, sorry. I saw something came on. Okay, so customers, so I'm up to customers now. Of course, there is no business without customers. And like a doctor in the dimension, I know Yema mentioned that you, you, you cannot do everything. So you have to know who are your customers. For instance, I mean, I'll, I'll share a very short story. Um, energy, I mean, we, the company was incorporated 2013 August and we started operation 2014 uh, August. So we've been around for about eight years now. And when we started, we were doing everything from me flying to Kaduna to sit with uh, people in Southern and Northern Kaduna that just want to power two lights and maybe, I mean, and listen to radio uh, to us deploying hundreds of kilowatts of system to uh, schools or hotels with up to 154 rooms and uh, they needed to power it on solar. So by the time we we're bringing in our investors, they asked me, young man, you want to kill yourself because you can't be everything to everybody. So you have to know 
what customer segment do you want to focus on where you have seen that you have enough market to be able to achieve uh, whatever vision that you have set for the organization over the short, the medium, and the long term. So it's important to know your customers. And it's also important to know that the customer's niche, quote and unquote, that you have decided to follow has enough disposable income or has enough capital, if it is, I mean, B2B that you want to focus on to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to enable you to achieve the, the end results. So grit, uh, like I mentioned in the opening remark, grit is one word that, uh, I mean, if you ask any energy uh, team member today, uh, they, will, they will be able to go on and on and tell you about grit. And I like how this puts it. G represents give it your all. R means redo if necessary. High means ignore giving up, especially in that climb. There will be several instances where you will just, I mean, like an entrepreneur friend told me uh, uh, one day, he said that, oh, Femi, I mean, he, he has uh, equity investors in his uh, company too. He said, Femi, I just feel like disappearing. You know, because there will be such time that you just feel like, oh, what, what have I gotten myself into? But if you have it as part of your values, if grit is part of your values, you know you cannot just give up because you have that end result in mind and it is great that we continue to drive you towards achieving that end result. And of course, you have to take time to do it right. You know, of course, there is the room for the minimum viable product MVP. And of course, I mean, it can be right the first time. But of course, even if you send that product out, uh, you have to continue that you have that grid to ensure that you get it to that product that uh, customers are happy about. And I mean, the word of mouth, even from your customers, will then continue to propel, to propel you. Uh, finance, of course, I mean, uh, Dr. Ndidi spoke so eloquently around this. There are several uh, sources of capital that you can, uh, that you can explore. While we were starting out, 2015, uh, we were able to bring in the Bank of Industry. Uh, Bank of Industry um, uh, gave us a debt capital. So, I mean, early in the business, we did not bring in equity. We started with debt. And not long after that, we were able to, uh, to attract a lot of grant capital. Uh, we won a 100,000 US dollar grant from the uh, US aid. Uh, and then we won, I mean, over like three different grants. We won about 250,000 pounds from the UK, uh, defeat now uh, FCD hope. So while starting, it is not out of place to look at what sort of grants are out there to help you to prove uh, your, your business model. And of course, I mean, if you are an experienced entrepreneur or you've been able to build a very solid team, there is also nothing stopping you to, uh, to go equity uh, around uh, almost immediately. I mean, there are a lot of angel investment group and angel investment syndicates in the country. I mean, this is 2021, not 2015. So we have, I mean, several uh, uh, angel investors and angel syndicates that are able to, if you have a fantastic idea uh, that uh, the uh, angels believe that it can scale. I mean, there is no lack of capital in Nigeria today. I mean, several, I mean, a few years ago, if you ask me what were my top three problems, finance is always on top of the pack, but I can tell you it's not even showing up on that list uh, any longer. Uh, partnership and transactions. So like I mentioned, one of the things that is also critical for business to scale in Nigeria and across Africa is partnership. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And I repeat, it does not make sense for any business that is just starting today to want to open in 54 countries in Africa. It does not make any sense. Um, I contemplated including a chart. So high energy, we are now, I mean, expanding into Africa and we are actually piggybacking on some of our customers. And those are telecom customers that, uh, I mean, I will speak more around that, I mean, when I speak uh, on the week. So partnership, as much as possible, 
try to see how you can leverage partnership to, to more or less arc the growth. And of course, transactions as they are growing in your, in your, uh, in your business life cycle, acquisition, acquisition is not, uh, I mean, is always on the table and you should always consider that as one of uh, the drivers uh, for your growth. Risk, I mean, risk is one that you can run away from uh, so Fabi, I mean, sorry, yeah. sorry to cut in. Uh, your slide is blown. I don't know what happened. Really? Is it better? Um, still the same. Wow. I think after you changed, um, the message popped up or something. You let me try to stop share and share again. Then. Is it better? Say system, not a problem. Maybe you can just continue. It's still the same thing. Chicken. Wow. Um, I would have loved that everyone is able to see the screen. Is still blurred? Yes. Okay, so the eight item is risk. Um, hopefully, maybe the next page will be better. Can you see? Can you can you see it now, or it's still blow? It's still blow. It's still some. Wow. Okay, so risk. Let me just pick around risk. Um, so of course, I mean there are a lot of risk. Uh, I mean that will battle with in this part of the. Uh, of the of the world, uh, I mean political risk, and it's also very important that you know about your risk, you know, because I mean as uh, you try to bring in investors, if you do, if you are not able to articulately uh, put together what your risk are and what are the strategies they are putting together to mitigate those risks, you might be seen as not knowing your business. So it's important that you are able to capture what your political risks are, what your technology risks are. And of course, uh, given what happened, uh, again, I mean, COVID-19 last year, uh, everyone had to go back to the drawing board to see how to mitigate the, the risk that COVID-19 brought into, into the world. You know, so ability to capture the risk well. So one of the things that we did in our organization is uh, we were able to last year when some of the verticals that we operate in that we deploy as solar solutions to uh, uh, hospitality and uh, hospitality and education, you know. So um, we then realized that some of these verticals were impacted negatively. And it's dawned on us that one of the verticals that we had not given um, Sorry about that. So, uh, so like I was saying, so one of those verticals that we then had to give uh, adequate attention to was telecommunication. You know, even though it's been on, I mean, uh, target verticals, we've not really been intentional until last year. And I could tell you because we we were able to go back to the drawing board to then uh, see how to mitigate the COVID nineteen risk. That singular act alone. Uh, was very instrumental to the upward trajectory that we are, we are experiencing in the organization today. So that's what risk can do. And your ability as entrepreneurs to be able to uh, analyze the risk and come up with what the mitigating factors or the mitigants will be to those risks. Of course, we're talking about Africa. Uh, I mean, it's a pity you can't see my screen. So creating one African market I mean, we have the African continental free trade area now, which uh, obviously has provided a better platform for organizations that are looking to scale in across Africa. And like I'd mentioned before, uh, it is uh, prudent to say that as you want to scale across Africa, 
Are you leveraging maybe your existing customers that have businesses or operations in those countries that you want to expand to or networks? So it could be distribution partnerships. And if you look at a lot of all, a lot of organizations that have scaled, even in Africa, you will see that a lot of them leverage partnerships. Um, I understand that, uh, I mean, the largest pay TV uh, uh, organization in Nigeria, they probably do not have up to five co uh, offices that they own, and they're everywhere you turn to in Nigeria. I mean, the largest uh, mobile network operator, MTN, in, in, in Africa, they leverage partnership a lot. I mean, you say that from, uh, from uh, even the towers now, the towers, the, those base stations, they don't own it now, even though when they started, they used to own it. A lot of the friendship centers of the mobile network operators that you see, they don't own it. It is owned by partners. So those are some of the strategies that you can leverage to, to, grow, to grow your business. Um, I mean, now I am showing the values because one of the things that is also very important and it's, that is not common, you know, we have, I mean, you go to several organizations in Nigeria, you see, oh, this is our mission, this is our visions, but companies don't leave it. Uh, and this is one that I would have loved, uh, I mean, everyone on the call to say, but I will share this uh, presentation with, uh, with Rome Business School uh, so that, I mean, you can make it available. Uh, it's very, very important that you craft what your values are uh, for your organization to scale. I've seen that a lot of companies that we look uh, at as uh, model organizations that are scaled, a lot of them had spent significant amount of time to craft values. And it is crafting your values that will drive the culture of the organization. One of the, I was, I mentioned two of our seven core values. And like I had entered before, on the top of our value system is grit. So, and we don't just say grit, it is called live the life of grit. So every of our entry, every, every of our employees, every of our member of staffs, they're meant to live the life of grit. And we put that together and I mean, we came together, uh, I believe we had maybe up to five sessions where everyone in the organizations came together to craft what a new value system should be. So by living the life of greed to say that you have to be resilient, to be resilient, pursue excellence, put in least two extras, it does make a huge difference. So those, I mean, that's one of the values that is driving our people today. I mean, a lot of people would say, oh, energy, you are innovative. You've been able to attract investors like the Bill Gates, uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, you've, uh, you've been able to bring in uh, top-notch equity investors like the government of Norway, European Union. How have you been able to do that? One of the things that is critical to that is because you don't just copy or we are not just looking at doing what, or just copying what the guy next door is doing. And that is being driven by one of our value systems that we call blaze a trail. And we explained that, we articulated that by saying tackle problems, tackle problems heads on. Lead the way, build unique services, products, markets, and opportunities for all. Okay, I don't know how much time I have left. Um, okay. Um, hello, I hope you can still hear me. Yes, we can. We can hear you, Tom. Okay, five more minutes. Okay, thank you. All right. So, again, apologies. I don't know what's happening to the screen. Um, so, I'd mentioned Blaze a Trail. One of the other values out of those seven value systems that we have is do more with less. And we articulated by, that by saying that you have to be creative and efficient with resources. Now, I mean, everyone is aware what a currency is, uh, is looking like today. So what that means is you have to be smart and do more with less, really. You have to be smart with resources. You have to be efficient with resources because it's not every time that you can just pass those costs to the customers, you know? So doing more with less 
is one of the value system that has helped us as an organization to stay uh, ahead, despite, I mean, the currency devaluation that we are experiencing uh, uh, in the country. Make heroes. Make heroes is one value system also that has helped with what we do. And we articulated that by saying, provide opportunities, collaborate. So you cannot do it alone. You can't be, I mean, they say one man can be an island. So you have to collaborate as much as possible. And we also articulated that by saying, unleash the potential in our people, in our customers and our partners within and outside the ecosystems. Um, Thank you uh, for, for inviting me again. Uh, again, I apologize that uh, you were not able to, to see the screen. I'm going to share it right away, uh, I mean, with the, with the organizers, and I'm happy to take questions uh, now. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Femi, for your wonderful presentation. Yes, um, the slides will be shared to you after this session. Um, if you have any questions, I believe we have questions that were for Mr. Femi on how, especially on the finance part, how to attract um, investors into uh, startups and scale, like he mentioned. So if you have any question for Mr. Femi, you can drop it on the chat section or you can as well lift, use the raise of hand button so we can just take your questions and we wrap up. So Mr. Fibi, you can stop sharing now. Okay. Okay, Peter, you can unmute. Does that mean you were able to see my screen now? No, we, we could see, no. but, it, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't stick clear. Peter, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. All right, thank you very much, Sam, and also thank you very much, Femi. I really thank you also very much for your presentation. And I see how far you've gone with, you know, um, you know, following the, this new, renew, renewable energy, knowing to the fact that we are looking at having a control on emission means very soon engines, we, we stop running as they used to run because uh, we have to totally depend on uh, renewables or hybrid, you know, to ensure that we'll power, you know, some areas. So my, my question would be this, you know, now looking at, you talked about the market segment, whereby you, you don't need to, you know, provide your services for everybody. If not, just like you said, you, you, you feel kill yourself, you understand. But then my, uh, I was looking at your installed base because at, at this time you, you're not, uh, you know, focus on a particular segment of customer. And I know as a registered engineer, a mechanical engineer by, by, by profession and registered also, I understand that we have an install, every organization that do some of, just like you do have an installed base. So what is your installed base? And also have you thought, because I was, I was thinking that very soon, there will be, there will, obviously there will be a change in, in the power sector. What if this happens? If you're supplying a particular area with your with your with your service and they're enjoying enjoying it because of the epileptic power supply, and maybe all of a sudden there's a change in the system, and you know this power becomes stable. You know, is there any continuity plan? You know, for me, I'm just thinking. You know, for people like us who want to you know go into business like this, you know, we need to get ideas from you know people like you who have you know been hands on. On your own business even if i work for a company but then you know you are facing it and you understand what it is to meet the customers directly and uh, how to serve them all right thank you for the question uh, i've just sent in the presentation because um, yeah uh, so mr sam please take take notes of that i've sent in the presentation so peter i will ask answer your question two two in one uh, the first question is on an install base so we have deployed about three megawatts uh, peak of, uh, of solar solutions across the country and uh, 10 megawatt hour of storage. And largely we deploy more of uh, solar, sorry, more of lithium storage nowadays. So when uh, in the early days, when we were still deploying portable solutions, I mean, we deploy, I mean, in the thousands, 
but we our our system now is like these modular five kilowatt solutions and we've deployed around 500 of that uh last quarter alone i mean we we onboarded uh close to 70 new telecom towers only between february and march so so the growth is uh, is really on the high now and we have excess of uh, 500 uh, deployments at the moment and we do that the focus now is we power homes of nigerians that uh, especially nigerians that are productive at home and what i mean by that is I mean, for people that are working from home now, we, we are able to power uh, their homes to ensure that they have uninterrupted power. Uh, of course, powering television, refrigerator, washing machine, deep freezers, and what have you. And for business verticals, I'd mentioned that the telecom, I mean, we are very active in the telecom uh, tower space now. We power a lot of schools. Uh, we power a lot of hospitals. Um, I mean, we, we also power SMEs in general. So those are our target, uh, target verticals nowadays. And your other question is on uh, how are we been able to scale? Can you remind me, please? No, the how other question, okay. okay, the other question is now owing to the fact that, uh, you know, we, we, yeah, we I, I, have I, a I remember. Yeah. I, I okay. remember. Okay. Let me, let okay. Take, yeah. So, I mean, that's a very good question, and I, I mean, I want to assure you that before we're able to bring in investors, those are questions that uh, almost every now and then. Uh, I mean, we had to answer that, uh, and again, the question of what you electricity gets better tomorrow in Nigeria. Uh, will energy still have a business to run? You know, uh, when I was giving my presentation, I discussed risk. You know, so those were some of the risks that we identified. Uh, for, for the mini grid players, so that we were deploying mini grid in rural communities, they call it a, a grid arrival. If grid arrives tomorrow in the what will happen? But since we focus now in the urban, uh, if power arrives or if grid gets better, what happens to businesses like ours? I will use uh, Lagos, for instance, especially in some clusters that experience 24 hours power supply, or close to 24 hours. And I'm talking of uh, the likes of Magodo and some other estates in, uh, in the mainland of Lagos. So, and I will also, uh, bring into the picture the advanced nations. And I'm talking of states like California that, have, that people are putting solar panel on the roof and countries like Australia that has more than a million deployments of solar and, uh, and storage. So what happened is number one, uh, starting from home, cost, and I'm talking of economics now. The thing is, you know, uh, I mean, a year ago, they used to pay, and I'm, I'm talking of the grid now, maybe 23 naira, they're about per kilowatt hour. Now it's about 50 something naira for the people in band A and band B. So it is not a cost. And, and I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom here. If they're going to get 24 hours of electricity, it's not going to be cheap because there is what we call the life cost of electricity. Uh, that's, that has to be taken care of for us to enjoy uninterrupted power supply. So when it comes to economics, solar uh, is, con is going to continue to be competitive. And I can tell you with the rising grid prices, we are close to what we call the grid parity. So, so what that means is over a long period of time when you amortize, can you hear me clearly? So I saw a note that uh, you can't hear me clearly. Please let me know if you can hear me. Your voice, your voice is your voice is cracking. Maybe that's the reason why. Okay. Um, is it better now? 
Uh, for me, it's the same. I don't know for other persons, but for me. Yeah. Let me try to. Maybe just give me. A it's still same. It's not clear. Is it better now? It's the same. It's the same. I, I see something is on speaker or something, and that's why it's echoing. Yeah, let me put some video I think we lost Mr. Femi, um, and we're, he was almost rounding up at this point. And it's really very important that um, he rounds up with the point that he was, the question that he was addressing. I do hope that he joins us. So this has been a very interesting two hour session. Um, it's planned to be two hours, but we eaten, we're already behind schedule on the two hour session. And I believe, but I believe that it has been insightful and it has been a session that um, is worth your while for the two hours. However, I will also have to say that um, one of our speakers was unable to join us. Um, his flight was delayed somewhere. And so he was thinking he would join us, but he is not able to make it. Hello, is, it so, is it better now, please? Okay, I'm it's better me. now. It's better now. Yes, sir. So sorry about that. Um, okay, so, so I was saying that, um, I was saying that the grid parity, that's the, the cost. Okay, very good. Um, I mean, technology, we just have to be ready and uh, have alternatives uh, at hand. So I was saying that grid parity, uh, because with the, increasing price or prices of uh, of the of the grid and i mean it's it's making it even uh, uh better now for for solar especially for organizations like ours that uh, that we're able to provide uh, a solution to customers on a long term or a pay small small business all right let me let me stop there. All right, thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure, Peter. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Femi, and thank you, Mr. Peter, for your question. And most of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to our faculty members on the call and to every student that joined us and prospective students of Rome Business School Nigeria who joined us on this call today. It has been an insightful session and we really appreciate our panelists for creating our time to be part of this industry spotlight. Um, this entrepreneurship series is aimed at supporting and also inspiring entrepreneurs among the room business school communities by bringing in industry experts and entrepreneurs as well who share their experience. Please feel free to connect with all of our speakers on LinkedIn and other social media channels. And of course, uh, for our master in entrepreneurship and innovation, um, they are already used to Mr. Ojeka and um, the likes of um, Mr. Fabi joining as well. So we really appreciate you today for joining us on this call. Um, on behalf of the founding president, Professor Antonio Ragusa, and the country director, Dr. Humphrey Akanazu, I want to say a big thank you to everyone that joined us on this call. 
and I say have a great evening ahead. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Femi. Thank you for thank you for having me. And apologies for the glitches, uh, but please. Uh, mm -hmm. Not thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Uh, it's been a nice time. Achieving.